everyone. I'm Emily. I'm one of the librarians here at Rockland Public Library, and we're thrilled to be hosting tonight's event. Um, I want to start the night off with a couple quick programming notes on upcoming events at the library. Next week on July 29th, Maine author Robin Clifford Wood will be discussing her book, The Field House. And the following week on August 5th, we'll have a screening of the film Peer Kids from POV by PBS. And I am happy to introduce tonight's speaker, Stuart Kestenbaum is the author of five collections of poems, most recently, uh, Things Seem to be Breaking, and a collection of essays, The View from Here. He was the host of Maine Public Radio program, uh, Poems from Here, and the host curator of the podcasts, Make Time and Voices of the Future. He was the director of Haystack Mountain School of Crafts from 1988 until 2015. And more recently, working with the Libra Foundation, he has designed and implemented a residency program for artists and writers called Monsoon Arts. Uh, Stuart Kestenbaum has written and spoken widely on craft making and creativity, and his poems and writing have appeared in numerous small press publications and magazines. He, has served as, he served as Maine's Poet Laureate from 2016 to 2021. And I'll turn it over to Stuart. Go right ahead. Thanks, Em. <laughs> Well, tonight, I, what I'd like to do is I'll, I'm going to read you some, uh, some uh, poems uh, and some short essays and then show you images from my latest book, Things Seem to be Breaking, which are blackout poems. So we'll have a, a presentation where you can see those images. This time of year always reminds me of when I first arrived in Maine a uh, number of years ago, back when I was a hitchhiker and I... Uh, came to visit my friend, Alice, who had a cottage, whose family had a cottage at Fly Point uh, in Brooklyn. And I got a ride most of the way uh, through a ride share thing from a radio station out of Boston, and then just got dropped off, stuck my thumb out and got a ride. And uh, I, you know, at a certain age, you don't actually think about what would happen if you didn't get a ride. So I somehow made it to the, to the cottage uh, late at night it's called To Alice, Who Taught Me About Poems. I remember when we would stay up all night, heading down to the village to watch the baker making the donuts, the greasy O's rising miraculously in the oil. I'm sure he was wondering why jerked up college kids would come down the hill to visit him. He was at work while we were at Discovery. Some jobs can be discoveries, not like the ones famous scientists make, but like those I made before I visited you that summer. I was working in the gas station, learning to stop the pump just right on the dollar, not going over by a penny, or cleaning the windshields perfectly with the squeegee, the water running down like a light show on the shadow of the dashboard. I hitchhiked from Boston to Maine to visit you at your cottage, getting a long ride in a hippie's recycled delivery van past the hulks of the schooners rotting in the harbor in Wiscasset past the souvenirs in Perry's Nuthouse in Belfast, until I was dropped off on Route 15, still 40 miles away in the mosquito-filled dusk near the humming and flickering lights of the gas station, like an Edward Hopper painting come to life. How is it when night comes on, we can feel so alive? The darkness is surrounding us, and we're standing with our hopeful thumbs out, waiting for a ride. Since, since I'm on the road and I, I mentioned donuts in that last poem, I'm gonna stick uh, with the coast and uh, read this poem, which uh, takes place in Bucksport. It's called uh, Rocky Coast. First, there was the pink granite, molten and buried for 350 million years. Then there was the ice encountering the ledge dragging rocks and trees over the land. And then the lichen working in the cold, ceaseless wind, cleaving to the stone, resurrecting the soil by eating away at the mica and quartz to make a thin layer of earth that the coast rests on. And then there was the Dunkin' Donuts built on the ledge in 1989 in Bucksport, Maine, the town where the paper mill makes clouds and sends them billowing out into the landscape the Dunkin' Donuts, where the coffee is always fresh, and when you inhale its aroma, it's as if you were starting the day again or starting your life over. 
one more chance. This is where I buy my chocolate sugar donut and drive down Route 15 in the dark when I bite down on an earring back baked into it. I dream of the million dollar liability settlement, enough to do whatever I would want, in return to show with horror the small steel post to the young woman in bright polyester at the counter who offers me a dozen free donuts, not enough to change my life, but enough to feed me for a while. And what else could you need? Sugar, fat, and the first bite like Eve's just before she walked out into the fallen world. When I, when I brought that uh, donut earring back to the uh, woman, she actually just said, oh, you know, they bake those in Bangor. I guess they didn't make them in Bucksport at the time as maybe that was uh, made they had, meant they had less uh, responsibility for it. This next series of poems are ones that I wrote uh, based on an, an idea I had when I was a visiting writer at the Penland School in North Carolina. And uh, Penland uh, is a craft school similar to Haystack. And uh, after I left uh, the directorship of Haystack, I was invited there to be a visiting writer. And I went down and, and uh, uh, I had a practice at Haystack where I would read poems uh, in the evening before presentations to groups as a way, not mine, usually poems by other people, but it, it was a way for people to kind of settle into listening and focus. And uh, so when I got to Penland, one of the, the workshop leaders at somebody uh, who had taught workshops at, at Haystack and uh, he asked if I would read a poem to his class in the morning, so I did. And then he said, oh, you're just like a tinker coming in here. And I said, well, if I were a tinker, you know, you'd give me things that were broken on and I repair them. So why don't you give me words and I'll, uh, I'll write a poem. And they did give me words and, that, and the, the, my assignment was I had to use those words in a poem. And I read, uh, and that started a, a series of poems where uh, I worked on poems based on words that people gave me. So when I got back from Penland, I wrote to friends, some writers, some scientists, a whole group of people and had them send me words. So it became the, uh, the core of, of uh, uh, my book, How to Start Over. So I'm going to read you, uh, read you some of those. Uh, this first poem is called uh, Decree. And uh, the words that I was given uh, were sliver, dog, evoke, marriage equality, pizza, emulate, Newtonian, swim, cupcake, cupcake delirium, and loose leaf. You know, the thing I liked about this is I never would use those words myself, but once you had them, it kind of, uh, it gives you a parameters, but it also frees you up to just kind of go for it because it's a, it's like a new material that you've been given. Decree. Let there be equality in every marriage and let love emulate Newtonian physics falling down to earth from the heavens so that we will understand that a pound of love drops at the same rate as a pound of iron or a pound of feathers. Only when love lands, it breaks into slivers of hope. Let the dogs roll in the shards and begin to trot deliriously in search of crusts of pizza and cupcake wrappers and swim to the land of dead things to roll in. For hope is eternal in all our hearts, animals and humans alike. And while we're at it, let's gather up the love and put it in loose leaf binders and page through what was, let was become is, let our hearts learn to be. Sometimes when I'd get close to the end of doing that, I'd realize there was a word that I hadn't put in and I, like it's finding a spare part when you're putting the toy together for your child and how to find a way to work it in. So it, it's a, uh, they're kind of, in some ways they're fragile structures uh, or one word can change the whole direction of, of the work. This poem is called, How to Start Over. And the words that I was given were pinhole camera, sharks, deteriorating, evergreen, silky, sleep, cement, row, serendipity, flight, moonbeam, gawk, thistle, satisfaction, worth, and conflagration.
how to start over. We knew that things were deteriorating, Gothic houses collapsing, sharks patrolling the lagoons, the born again ministers warning of an immediate conflagration. All the flights to paradise had been canceled and even pinhole cameras weren't letting light in. It got to be so bad, we didn't wanna to listen to the news anymore where all we were doing was gawking at someone else's trouble. It wasn't worth the effort. Where was the satisfaction we longed for? We couldn't sleep, so it spent all night watching the full moon's beams cement themselves to the silky water and travel for miles on the waves. Someone was rowing along the shore, and in the, sil in the silver light, the evergreens were shaking slightly. At the edge of the forest, the thistles were attaching themselves to the fur of animals. What serendipity to hitch a ride to your future. The, the poems that I, I uh, worked on when I wrote to my friends, they just sent me words I, and I put them on small pieces of paper, cut them up and then just picked out, you know, one from each person who sent me. So I, I didn't, I couldn't anticipate what they would be. And at Penland, people just would run up with scraps of paper and give them to me at all times during the day. They were quite excited to hand me words. Uh, it made a made the poem in some ways a participatory experience. This poem is called Hermit's Dream. And the words that I was given were marsupial, mountain, basket, cleft, immensely bacon, pattern, noodle, anxiety, rigor mortis, stoicism, applesauce, stressed, passion, silhouette, and bedfellows. Hermit's Dream. Living on the mountaintop, I missed coffee and bacon at first. Who doesn't? And later began to dream of simple things like applesauce and noodles since I was living on air. Passion takes many forms, my master had always stressed. Look for patterns, he said. Being and non-being are strange bedfellows. One day, anxiety left, drifting off and settling in a rock cleft far below. When the light was right, I could watch its silhouette moving wildly. I learned the names of my fears and put them in a basket. Each day, I would climb up the ledges, remembering who I had been, feeling like a marsupial carrying all those personalities in my pouch. And then there was nothing, but it's not what we fear, no rigor mortis. I was alive and dancing in this immense nothing that is everything. Stoics were laughing, birds were singing first morning. Uh, this poem is called Sleep. And uh, the words uh, that I were given are bedtime, lake, necessary, spalted, as in like spalted maple, fever, jewels, sparrows, and ice. Sleep. This is the bedtime of your imagined childhood. The cabin window is open and you can hear the lake. You can smell the fresh water. Today's blinding jewels of sunlight on the surface are gone. In this growing dark, perhaps the moon will rise. A loon will call out and another will call back. A sparrow appears at the window. Such a small spirit. It's as if your soul is connected to the night. And isn't it? Aren't we joined one thing to the other, like the ice crystals that make their way over the surface? Or how fungus grows in spalted wood, the black lines manifesting the microscopic. It's your life. Dream whatever is necessary. Then uh, one time I was giving a, a talk at a Eastern Maine Medical Center as part of a medical humanities program and the people, uh, it was a group that met regularly from the hospital and I was one of the speakers. And when they found out that I was doing poems like this, they decided to send me words before I got there. I'd never had that happen. So this was a, a poem that I wrote for the occasion of being there. And the words that I was given were melody, vicissitudes, weevil, laugh, deceit, 
betrothed, burden, salubrious, peepers, as in uh, like the, the frogs, peepers, and caterwaul. Evening song. At first, you can't hear the melody, your mind being too busy replaying the vicissitudes of every day with its petty deceits. Does it feel that you are betrothed to a burden? Toward evening, you walk into your field to see the larvae of weevils ready to burrow into everything you've planted. Time to blame someone else, caterwaul against confusion. And then you hear them, the spring peepers in the pond emerging from some salubrious laboratory of life to sing, if not a hymn of happiness, then at least a raucous tune made of water and light. Why not laugh? How much more do you need? Uh, during the, the pandemic, I began to write uh, differently. It was an unusual time for everybody and you know, it's still an unusual time for everybody. Maybe it's always an unusual time for everybody, but this was, was a, different in a way that I didn't know. And I, I uh, have been writing shorter, uh, you know, 500 word essays. And I'd like to read you a, a few of those that uh, you know, uh, speak to the emotional climate of the time. And I, both these, one, one of these was in a, an online publication called uh, Hole in the Head Review, which is from Maine. And the other is in the Union of Maine Visual Artists Journal where I have a quarterly, I read a, a quarterly essay. Inhale. Back in April, when there were YouTube videos of doctors and scrubs showing us how to disinfect everything we brought home from the grocery store, and the sense of the impending pandemic felt to me like waiting for a hurricane to strike, I was invited to be interviewed for a Zoom program at Opera House Arts in Stonington called Coffee on the Couch. The idea was simple, a 25 minute conversation, coffee cups in hand, with three of the staff asking me questions about what I was doing in this time of isolation. It felt as if the world had shut down and it was good to be in this small digital community for a short while in a sad and dangerous time. Toward the end of the conversation, I was asked if I could describe a special place that I like to go on Deer Isle, from which I inferred a place of natural beauty that might bring some solace. While there are many wonderful locations to choose from, the place I thought of came to me fairly quickly, my front porch. Our house is right on Route 15, the main road on the island, and we overlook Northwest Harbor in Deer Isle Village. It's a combination of a stunning view of the main coast accompanied by a soundtrack of pickup trucks, cars, and tractor trailers. Any vehicle coming from the mainland heading to Stonington will pass by. It's idyllic with an occasional roar. From this vantage point, I can follow the arc of the sun as it moves from winter to summer. At the winter solstice, it's setting over Deer Isle Village just before four. And at the height of summer, it has traveled far to the Northwest, setting at the head of the harbor nearly four and a half hours later in the day. At the fall and spring equinoxes, it lines up directly with the front of our house, dazzling light that illuminates the dirt on the window panes, every cobweb in the corner of the house and nicks in the plaster. It's as if my house were built to track the seasons, my own Stonehenge with a porch. Like Stonehenge, we have visitors too. Some summer evenings at sunset, we experience a frenzy of beauty seekers. Cameras in hand, tourists stop in the middle of the road to pull over and block, and block our driveway or walk down in the field across from our house, hoping to capture the moment when the pinks and reds, grays and blues will fill the Western sky. Eventually the tourists go, but the beauty remains. The cat's paw of wind on the surface of the water, spring pollen floating at the shore, the austere autumnal light on the mud flats, the days that are all blue and white, cumulus clouds and white caps the harbor ice freezing and breaking on the tide, the gulls flying over the still harbor at twilight with such a clear reflection in the water that I can't tell if it's upside down or right side up. While COVID-19 was moving in its own ingenious and awful way around the world, we were moving around the sun. Some of those rotating days, I was sitting on the porch 
which in the middle of a chaotic time felt to me like I was taking a deep breath. Since the pandemic arrived, I've been reminding myself to breathe and am reminded of speaking figuratively of moments that take our breath away, like during those times when we experience great beauty or horror. To take our breath away is to take away what gives us life, which is to say that it's in those moments when we awake to our own mortality. Isn't that awakening also at the heart of the poem, the painting, the dance? It's when we know we are alive, inhaling the world around us. And this is a, a poem I wrote uh, during the pandemic. I think there's a feeling, I had a feeling of just, uh, the world was uh, quiet and in a way and awful things were happening and there's such a sense of uncertainty and I think I was responding to that. The work at hand. You wake from the dream uncertain if you are living in this world or the next, pretty sure that no one is dreaming you, but unsure if someone might be dreaming this world, watering the flowers, shaping the clouds, and watching the birds build their nests, a skill, our art, our craft, a beautiful necessity, while we inhale and exhale the deep breath of our days, our anonymous days, our days of shopping lists and headlines, the days that we dream ourselves up and out the door, and on our way to work. And what is our work but to scatter the seeds and dream ourselves whole? And this is uh, another uh, essay a little bit later in the, in the pandemic. I did a lot of walking, kind of dangerous walking around here because people drive cars fast and there aren't great shoulders, but, but I would walk every day. And uh, this is a kind of meditation that grew out of that. It's called Every Step. Since the pandemic started, most of my travel has been on foot. Lately, I've been taking a daily walk to both clear my mind and open my eyes. It's a three mile loop that takes me past once stately Greek revival homes, old farmhouses, small capes and trailers. I walk by the cemetery where small flags mark each veteran's grave. I'm on paved roads and dirt roads. There's a pasture where sheep once grazed. Lobster boats and traps are at rest in yards. Spruce and birch trees, trunks snapped by wind, lay down in the ordered chaos of the woods. There's a new digital sign outside the town hall that lets me know the time and temperature in that Deer Isle was incorporated in 1789. It also says, mask up, save a life. If I'm trying to write something, my walk is a break when the right words may appear. If I'm lucky, they'll stick. Other times, the answer vanishes as quickly as one of the pickup trucks speeding by. Like the best of our excursions, I discover more when I'm not exactly looking and just follow my steps. Skunk cabbage emerging out of gravel and silt by the roadside in the spring. Thin, clear ice in shallow pools in the woods in December. An otherwise straight spruce tree about 15 feet above the ground has conformed to the curve of an enormous granite boulder. Jimmy Cook, the UPS driver, passes me on the opposite side of the road and recognizes me only from my back. He waves with his left hand out the window of his truck. I wave back so he'll see me in the mirror. Two pilgrims. Last week, with very little snow on the ground, I take a trash bag with me to collect litter. My haul includes a crushed Poland spring bottle filled with muddy water, Budweiser cans with seasonal designs, a Baxter brewing can, a quart-sized Mountain Dew bottle, a gallon windshield fluid bottle with its label gone, and a Cabot whipped cream that was tossed out of a car window after someone huffed the nitrous oxide. I'm a roadside social scientist or a child at Halloween, happy to keep filling my bag with each new treat. Along the shoulder, I reach down to pick up what looks like a styrofoam cup. I discover it's not plastic, but sodden paper, a fragment of a note card. As I'm walking, keeping an eye on the approaching trucks and an icy and muddy shoulder, 
I drop it in the bag and notice it says heart, handwritten in blue ink. It's a rare find in an age of texts and phone messages. I sort through my bag when I get home to retrieve it, eager to see this evidence of a civilization that had a written language. Here's a poet on a walk who finds the word for the day, heart. I look more closely as it dries out and see that what's written is T-H-E-A-R-T. Perhaps this was once a sweetheart, a blossoming of love, or something we can't quite name that has been lost, but the heart remains. Or maybe it's a message about creativity, the art with no space between the words. Even a simple word may not be so simple. Each word is like a step and every step can be its own meditation. Everything we find can lead us somewhere. Jimmy, the UPS driver, liked, liked that. I liked having him in something I wrote. And this is a, the last of the kind of pandemic series. It's called Prayer for the World. Every drawing begins with one mark. Every song begins with one note. Every poem with one word. How else could we get started without the first gesture? And even if that one move gets obliterated, changed, or forgotten, let us offer our gratitude because it got us to the next step and the next step after that. And before we realize it, we are explorers wandering in today's terra incognita, explorers making note of every new bird call and blossom, every pickup barreling down the road every barking dog in this brave new world that has been built over yesterday, brick by holy brick. So now I'd like to move to the, showing you uh, the Black Eyed poems that I've been working on. And uh, just to give a little uh, uh, background, Em's gonna go through these as I'm, as I'm talking, but I began doing these Black Eyed poems it actually grew out of a workshop that I was teaching with my wife, Susan Webster, about writing words and images. And we wanted to do something that would get students to think about words differently. They were not necessarily writers. And what we did is uh, Susan made a template. And I don't know if you can see this because I'm off to the side, but it was a template about this size. And uh, every student was to put it over some found text from an old book we found at the dump. And then uh, just pick words and be able to write, outline, you know, black out the words. And I had never done that before, but I thought I should be not a teacher who doesn't do what you're asking the students to do. So I did the same thing. And I black, but I went very minimal. I just kept one or two words. And I, and the, it was uh, a small pond. And then I had rubber stamps with me. And I wrote above it, Thoreau's dream. And it just felt like it, to me, it was a, a call and response. It's very minimal. It's kind of a blackout haiku is the way I look at it. And I've, you know, continued those and, and it seemed, uh, uh, I, I, it's a very different way to work. It's, uh, I spent many years with visual artists and to me, these are, visual poems. It's a, um, I get to actually manipulate, work with material to cut a window in uh, paper, to have a, a Sharpie marker where I black out the words. And the text that I use, I had one was a Larry King's autobiography, Dick Cheney's autobiography. Another book is uh, uh, apocalyptic uh, fiction by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. Uh, uh, another Scott Peck, How to Love. So I, I don't really try to take in the text so much as just look for some 
some words that kind of speak to me in some way. And, and these were made uh, during uh, the Trump years and then during the pandemic. So the title of the book, Things Seem to Be Breaking, seemed pretty apt to me. And uh, I think that will, uh, that will come up in a little bit. So in the book, I think there are 64 images in all. And since I finished that, I've, I've continued to work that way. Um, I want, always want to be in a mental frame of mind where I can't really predict what's going to happen. I want it to be, uh, I, I believe in this kind of writing, any kind of writing, if I, if I can't be surprised, uh, then I'm not fully in, involved in it. I have to come to it fresh each time. It's it's uh, like, uh, and then of course I also felt like I worked for the CIA because I had I was redacting everything. Redacting so big now, so. That's where the title of the book came from. These were also on a show at a uh, Cove Street Gallery in Portland, along with work that I'd done with Susan Webster, collaborative work, and then some of Susan's work. So some of the pieces are still, they're still on the website there. If you want to go back and see them. That's my template. It's just the one I showed you, it's just like this. That's my finger. So uh, good, that, that's the group of poems that comprise the, the book, Things Seem to Be Breaking. And then to the last poem I'll read to you and then uh, answer any questions you might have is one, uh, you know, as poet laureate during the Maine's bicentennial, uh, un unfortunately, the celebration of Maine Statehood Day never happened because it's March 20th and that's when everything closed down, uh, or March 15th. Um, so I prepared a poem to read at the celebration of Maine's bicentennial. What really, even though I've been poet laureate for five years and had a, you know, a number of engagements, it was kind of my first uh, state activity in a way. And, uh, and so I'm gonna read you the poem that I wrote for that occasion called Kingdom of Beauty. There are so many beauty salons in Maine. You can see them everywhere in old brick buildings of refurbished downtowns, in strip malls, in trailers, in cities and villages. Our beauticians must be doing more than cutting hair. They must be making beauty itself. How else to explain its abundance all around us? The way the first light of morning touches the tops of the spruce trees across the harbor, or a mackerel sky blankets the heavens, or the way the fog drifts over the barnacles working quietly in the waves without us. How else to account for the blue light in the deep snow, the soft drift of fallen apple blossoms in May's air, or the crimson of the blueberry barrens 
where the glacial boulders work their slow way over the land. Even if our beauticians haven't manufactured all of this, and we gratefully acknowledge the touch of the divine hand wherever we look, they remind us that our hands can help make beauty too. We can see the evidence everywhere in the circles of burned rubber made by the pickup trucks dancing over the blacktop, in the curve of a canoe's bow rippling a silent lake, in the space inside the split ash basket, in the prayer of a white steeple, in the patched quilt on the bed, in the sure way an elegant knot is tied to hold a load on a trailer, for aren't work and beauty a partnership? Think of the hands that held the chisels and wedges to build foundations of granite block. Let us praise the ingenuity it takes to cut and lift and place ancient stones to bear the weight of the present and the future. 200 years later, the house still standing, faithfully greeting today's light. Thank you. So now we have time for questions or answers or just to talk about things. And I think you can either get those to M or uh, you can put them in the put them in the chat. Thanks so much, Stuart. Uh, I have a quick question to start out. Uh, what are your, some of your favorite poets working today? Who inspires you? Who inspires me? Uh, I'm inspired by uh, Wes McNair, by Naomi Shihab Nye, uh, by um, Betsy Scholl. Baron Wormser, a number of, of uh, Maine poets by Elizabeth Tibbetts, who's a, a Maine poet who lives in Hope nearby. Uh, I think what I really appreciate is when somebody uses language in a way that I wasn't expecting, and I think that, that they all do. Can you talk about, um, with both of your uh, very unique processes here, both the blackout and the, um, the gathering words from other participants, um, what are your first steps with each of those, those processes? Are they, are they different? What are, what are some of the, the techniques you use in building a poem from some of those techniques? Well, the, with, the, with the blackout poems, I think I'm just looking for a little bit like a, you know, the Ouija board when you move your fingers on the, on the Ouija board and take, I take this template and I, which I showed before and I just, I move it around the text of a page and I'm just looking for some phrases that somehow speak to me in some way. I don't know exactly how, what I'm going to write and the phrase I'm going to respond with, but, but just that somehow it speaks to me that has something that's evocative in it. And, uh, you know, I think the the important thing for me is to come to it fresh each time. So I have to be like really open minded when I'm looking at it, and then I'll then I'll write in pencil underneath it what my response is, and that's where I get the what I'm going to stamp. Occasionally, I'll just let it sit then and and look at it, and I may decide there's another phrase that would be more appropriate. But mostly, I'm just. So it's a very intuitive process. I'm just looking for something that's gonna, uh, that gets my attention that's in that. And I, I'm, I try, I'm not really reading the text for any meaning other than I'm looking at the words. I don't want it to be related in any way to what I'm writing. And, and the books are all books that would, normally I, I wouldn't uh, you know, do anything to a book, but these are books that were already on, on their way uh, out of, stopping being books because they're damaged, the spines were gone. So uh, those are the books I use. With the, with the poems where people gave me words, uh, I think it's mostly just first, just kind of taking the whole of the, all those words in and trying to sense some, some kind of meaning within that, but, but then it's really a matter of getting started and, and finding 
you have to start somewhere, you know, and that's going to determine the rest of it. It's like, you're actually building, you know, it's, it's, uh, You know, in the video games, it looks like there's a road ahead of you, but it's actually being built as you as you're working. And I think it's a it's a little bit like that. So once I'll, you know, find a, uh, some image like in the uh, the hermit's dream poem about uh, I don't I can't remember exactly how I got started, but once it's it's once that first word's down there, it's like a foundation. Then then the other words are going to lock. I, I need to find meaning within those other words within the context of where I've started. It's basically the way I've worked with it. Thanks for that. I love the imagery of the, the Ouija board, the moving the template around. Yeah. Um, I have one question in the chat from Lois Ann. She says, Stu, thank you so much. I enjoyed hearing your work. Would you please speak about collaborating on pieces with your wife? My husband and I are both artists and we talk about collaborating, but so far it's just talk, thanks. Yes. Well, uh, the way that Susan and I began to collaborate is many years ago, we were invited by Bruce Brown, who was then the curator of uh, the um, uh, Center for Maine Contemporary Art. And he, when it was in Rockland, or excuse me, Rockport, and he had invited couples uh, to show work together. And now I don't make visual work. So uh, Susan and I, it just gave us the impetus to make work together. And you can even see that's, that's, that's one of the first pieces that we did. Uh, and it was in 2004. And then we got to the show and we realized everybody else, you know, it, they were all couples and they made art, but they didn't collaborate. There was like, you know, the husband was a painter, the wife was a furniture maker and they just had, had their work in the show. So it's like almost reminded me of school when you misunderstood the assignment you know, but something great came out of it. And we began to work together. We'd never, we don't talk about how we're going to work together other than uh, generally Susan will generate an image. I'll look at the image and I'll generate text. And then, then it may go back to her and she may add to the, the work. Generally she works with uh, prints or drawings. And then, so she may add more color or add more imagery after she reads what I wrote, but Generally, we find we're kind of working in a similar emotional space, I think, is, is how we, we work with our collaboration that way. It's not that, that we say, oh, let's make something about loss. It's like we're both feeling a sense of loss and the work that comes out reflects that. So it's more that, that it's the ground that we're operating from. And then the other rule we have is if, if either one of us doesn't like it, after we're done, then we just pull it. We each have a, have a veto power. And generally we, we see, uh, you know, eye to eye on it. Even, you know, there could be day-to-day -day things that we may uh, have differences about. Somehow with the artwork, it seems that it's, it's, it's been, uh, I don't know, it's a little bit like making music together, I guess. Uh, and I, we haven't, uh, we just finished a, a lot of work a while ago and we haven't done anything new lately. So I'm not sure, you know, what the next iteration will be, but, but it, they seem to evolve pretty naturally too. Thank you. Um, any other questions either in the chat or if you want to ask um, on mic? Oh, and Lois says, thank you for that. You're welcome. All righty. I think if there's no other questions, then that'll do it for tonight. Thank you so much, Stuart, for coming and speaking to us tonight. Yes. It's a very easy commute. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, have a good night, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. Bye.